You know, this just might be my favorite ghost movie of all time. You know, I couldn't agree more. I know, right? It's, it's awesome! awesome. What is up everybody? Welcome to my review of Peter Jackson's The Frighteners. By far one of my favorite, if not my favorite, ghost movies of all time. One of my favorite horror comedies of all time. One of my favorite B movies of all time. I have loved this thing ever since I saw it in the theaters with my dad when I was six years old. And it's been one of those movies that I have continued to sing its praises. And all these years later, it still shocks me how few people talk about The Frighteners. So those of you guys that have been following me recently have noticed that at least once a month I've been trying to do like a hidden gem throwback movie review and this month I actually wanted to do two. I had kind of a slower week and so just a couple of days ago I released a review for 2008 Sex Drive, one of my favorite comedies of all time. Please check that out if you've not already. But The Frighteners is one that of the movies that I've done so far is probably arguably the most well known among them for the hidden gems but for the amount of people that I interact with that constantly talk about certain horror movies and franchises and standalone movies, this is still just so far below the level of recognition and notoriety that I think it deserves. And so we're here to try to change that. And in the off chance that you actually do have a poltergeist or a paranormal event in your house and you gotta have somebody come and do a psychic clearing but you're a little short on cash, check out the sponsor of today's video, Dave. None of us are immune to financial issues and unexpected expenses coming up out of nowhere. Especially if you own a home, a vehicle, or have a couple of kids, you know this all too well. Well, everyday situations like these is where Dave can help. Dave is a banking app that could get you up to $500 instantly with Dave's extra cash. And with Dave, there's no interest, no late fees, or credit checks. So by using Dave, you could fill up your gas tank before your paycheck drops or buy that last minute gift for that birthday party that your kids forgot to tell you about till the last minute. So download Dave today at dave.com slash Cody. That's dave.com slash Cody. Sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking services provided by Evolve, member FDIC. And thank you to Dave for sponsoring today's video. So The Frighteners is a cult classic horror comedy starring Michael J. Fox, directed by Peter Jackson, who has gone on at, right after this movie, in fact, to do one of the most acclaimed trilogies of all time in Lord of the Rings, has become one of the most notorious directors of all time right after this, but his early career, he did a lot more horror stuff. Dead Alive is one that a lot of people are really big fans of that I still haven't seen. So in The Frighteners, you have Michael J. Fox as the main character, Frank Bannister, and after an accident, he is able to communicate with and see ghosts. He's friends with a couple of them and has kind of a scam business where he sends his friend ghosts into a house. They cause some chaos, and the homeowners call him to do a fake clearing, and then he charges them a ridiculous amount of money for it. Well, I'd say the whole thing is going to set you back somewhere in the neighborhood of $450. <laughs> Although we could forget about defense, call the whole thing even. But then these mysterious deaths start to plague his town that are very similar to a dead serial killer from years past. And Frank is the only person who is able to see signs and clues and premonitions of what is going to happen to these people. And so suddenly he has to take his very selfish, self-absorbed business and use his powers to try to save people. This movie came from an original idea of Peter Jackson and his wife. It was eventually picked up and produced by Robert Zemeckis, who directed the Back to the Future trilogy, which probably had something to do with Michael J. Fox being cast in the lead role. Universal Studios had extreme confidence in the concept and the script to the point where they actually gave Zemeckis and Jackson final cut approval which is not something you hear of very often, especially in medium to bigger budget movies. And all of the writing was on the wall. All of the signs were there that this was actually going to be a really big hit movie. And then the good old dickheads at the MPAA completely fucked it. Because of a couple of violent sequences in this, of which there certainly are, the MPAA slapped this movie with an R rating that no matter what they tried to do to cut and mitigate certain things, they could not escape. And so this was released to the public as an R rated film. And if you've seen this, you know that that is absolutely ridiculous. Because while there are some violent scenes, while there is a very minimal amount of gore here, the tone, the comedic approach, and the subject matter 
no reason whatsoever why this movie should not have been PG-13. This movie has a very similar approach and a very similar tonal balance to Ghostbusters, while Frightener certainly dives a lot more into the darker territory as the movie goes on, but it fits into that kind of a vibe as far as the family-friendly, yet some adult themes. And so the PG-13 miss out as far as not being able to reach that audience or anybody that wasn't allowed to go to the theater or maybe saw the Raiden and just assumed the movie was going to be much more violent and dark than it actually was is one of the reasons, one of many reasons, why this was not a gigantic success and why ever since 1996 it has remained one of those films that those of us that know about it and love it absolutely love it, but there's a lot of people out there that have never heard of it. So starting off with the positives and the laundry list of reasons why you should absolutely check out The Frighteners, I love the tone that this movie goes for and that balance of horror and comedy. Now, I'm somebody where I'm a very hard audience for comedy, and so there's a lot of horror comedies out there that really don't do it for me because the comedy isn't funny enough for me, and they don't tend to dive enough into the horror side of things. And this is one of those movies that I think finds that perfect balance to where it's genuinely amusing and very entertaining and humorous throughout the film, but it doesn't shy away from those darker elements. It doesn't shy away from the horror side of things. You have a very quirky main character. You have a very silly cast, a B-movie's dream of a cast here. You have very lighthearted characters throughout, but as you start to reveal more about that serial killer entity that is going around and start to get more into the third act of the film where certain reveals are made and a lot more danger is presented to the main characters, it doesn't shy away from showing some gore and showing some people get killed and having some very dark elements brought out in Jeffrey Combs' character. And so there is a lot of elements here that you can just sit back and enjoy with a family of mostly all ages, and yet when it dives into those darker things, it scratches that itch of the horror fan, but never goes too far to where you're going to lose that younger audience. And Michael J. Fox being in the lead role here is absolutely the heartbeat of the movie, one of my favorite actors of all time, and aside from the Back to the Future trilogy, this is my favorite thing that he has ever done, and one of the last really big things that he has done, unfortunately, because of his illness starting pretty close to when this movie came out, pretty close afterwards. And I love his character. I love what they explore with this character. I love the different elements of what Michael J. Fox brings to this character because throughout the movie's beginning, he's not really somebody that you have a whole lot of reason to like. He's a con artist. He's not very friendly with people. He isn't even really all that friendly with his ghost friends that he works with. He's just kind of like this isolated person in this community that everybody's got kind of an off opinion of. And until you get into the back half, the last third of the film, where he genuinely starts to make these changes to where he's actively going to put himself out there to try to save people and try to stop this evil entity, do you start to see some of that character art come through and that natural kind of heartwarming charm that Michael J. Fox brings really starts to show through in the character. I mean, this is essentially a story about grief and redemption. You have a character of Frank Bannister who feels this enormous amount of guilt for the death of his wife, which he has no recollection of and is just told for the longest time that he is at fault for it, and his life just stops after that. The house that he was building just remains this project. He dives everything into this paranormal scam artist job and doesn't even really form much of a relationship with the ghost that he's working with, is completely isolated from his town or any human interaction whatsoever. He almost exists himself as a ghost in this town, even though He's physically there. And when you have this situation that is brought up by this evil entity and these people that are dying and he's the only person that sees what is truly happening is the only person that can actually help these people and yet he is fighting against damn near the entire town that thinks that he is involved somehow or that he's at fault or he is the killer and just nobody really gives him any form of reinforcement of a motivation besides just a moral compass to actually do the things that he does here. It makes you endear yourself to his character, and by the end of it, when he stops this entity, when he finds a new love, when he finds a new reason to keep going beyond the death of his wife, you see kind of that rebirth 
of his motivation to live and you see that redemption for all these things that has just held onto his heart for so many years. And so for a movie that has such a dark edge by the back half and has such a goofy non-serious tone throughout most of it, it has this really solid character arc and a really good thematic exploration of everything regarding his character's guilt and redemption that Despite the fact Michael J. Fox is damn near impossible to dislike, no matter how unlikable his character is, you just dive into this character's journey and you're with him and he has your interest and he has you rooting for him throughout the entire story. And surrounding Michael J. Fox, as I've already referenced, is like a B-movie cast dream. You've got D. Wallace, who is might as well just be the sweetheart of horror in here. You've got Jeffrey Combs from The Reanimator, and he's possibly the standout of the movie because his performance is just so unhinged. My body is a road map of pain. Giving him a solid run for his money is Jake Busey in really unhinged and crazy and maniacal in his villainous role. Even glorified cameo roles like Arlie Ermey more or less resurrecting his character from Full Metal Jacket. You have been told to stay away! Sound off like you've got up here! This thing is just absolutely stacked with people that horror lovers know well and love seeing. And if you're somebody who is a fan of Peter Jackson's work on the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which most of Earth seems to be, a lot of that credit for him learning and kind of stretching his legs to be able to take on that project is due to the Frighteners. You see a lot of his filmmaking, a lot of his shot choice, the New Zealand landscape, and even the special effects here as kind of being like him stretching his legs and getting some things out of his system and figuring out his craft before he takes on a project of that size. And this is just a gorgeous movie for such a silly B-movie tone that this goes for and for something that could have gotten away with much less quality filmmaking and probably still been very entertaining. This is a gorgeous movie to look at. I mean, the New Zealand landscape itself just kind of brings in all of those haunting tones to a ghost movie that you want to where there's this really great Green Hill landscape in the background, really good architecture in these buildings that has that gothic feel that it's going for, but that cold, wet, rainy atmosphere completely feeds into that ghost feeling that you want to where they always look cold and wet and miserable, and just the setting of the movie adds that in, even without them having to make the ghost look that way with the makeup. And while admittedly there are a few moments, a few shots, a few specific sequences in here, as far as special effects that haven't aged completely gracefully, that's a drop in the bucket compared to how awesome and how timeless a lot of the digital effects in this movie are, namely with the design of the ghost, which is very similar to what he used in the future in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. The way they design these ghosts to be these human characters that have like these permanent tears, this permanent wet look to them, and this really light blue glowy hue while also being transparent in the image is just a really cool yet very simple design, which is why it has aged so well, because they didn't just try to go balls out with what was available in 1996, which wasn't very much. And at the same time, the way that they did that kind of split photography that you see in a lot of movies where they have to have somebody play twins to where there is a human person that is in camera talking to somebody that is not physically there, and then they have to go and reshoot the exact same scene with the ghost character without the lead actor, that is most of this movie. Every single ghost character that Michael J. Fox interacts with He's interacting with like a tennis ball or an X on the wall or somebody holding up a sign with a picture of a ghost. And the way that they seamlessly shot both versions of those scenes and put them together, you would never be able to tell that these people are not actually interacting with each other because they just, the timing is perfect. The cadence of their conversation never misses a beat. And even just the way that they're looking at each other, it never has that weird uncanny valley where you can tell that something's not real here. And pulling that off is impressive enough because we have seen that done really poorly. As recently as The Flash that I just reviewed last week, there's some moments that you can tell something's not real going on there in a movie with 2023 level of technology available. But the fact that they could pull that off for the amount of scenes that they require to do that in this film, which is most of the runtime, 
absolutely impressive. As far as the narrative structure, I love the way that this movie unfolds throughout the three acts because the first act is very much just this silly horror comedy with ghosts and it's so enjoyable. Then you get that more mystery element in the second act of the film with something nefarious going on with this entity and what exactly is happening, who is the entity, how do you stop the entity, what is the entity's plan, and then the third act where things just go bonkers and you get reveals and character turns and a lot more of the more maniacal B-movie classic performances out of some of these actors is just so enjoyable and you never get to a point in this film to where the shtick that they're going for starts to run out of gas because they always have something new to replace it with to where no matter how many times I have seen this movie and I have watched it a lot both the theatrical and the Peter Jackson director's cut it is always such a fun ride that just flies by. And finally, I got to give huge praise to the score by Danny Elfman. This is by far one of my favorite scores that he has ever done, and it's one that nobody ever brings up. Everybody always brings up Batman and all these other ones that he is really well known for. But with the Frighteners, he brilliantly captures the horror and the comedy tones that this movie is going for. Like there's this really toy-like quality to the notes that he's going for in the early parts of the film where it's more just kind of that goofy B-movie vibe. But as things start to get more intense, his score swells up and there's just more colors to what's going on with the music and there's a lot more intensity and just all throughout it, there's all these different notes to what he is doing that just matches perfectly with what is going on on screen. And that is the score's job at the end of the day, is to match and enhance everything visually that is happening. And he does a perfect job with that. As far as the negatives, I personally don't have any issues with this film. I've loved it since 1996. I've rewatched it many, many times. And even just yesterday rewatching it again, it's a perfect experience for me. I love every single moment of it. and. It's a movie that I honestly could sit down and watch again today and be just as entertained as I was 24 hours ago. The only thing worth noting, to be fair, which I've already kind of noted, but there are certain segments here where the visual effects have not aged so well and maybe weren't even all that great in 1996. I can't really put myself back into that headspace as a six-year-old because everything looked awesome to me. But it's mainly just in the segments with the Grim Reaper entity. Now there's shots, there's segments where it looks really cool and convincing. There's others where it looks really cartoonish and kind of video game quality compared to the pristine special effects that are on all the other ghost characters. But I still think that really works into the B-movie vibe that this is going for to where it doesn't distract me, it doesn't stand out, it's not like this big glaring issue with the film. It works for the vibe of the movie for me. So that's really the only issue that I could understand anybody really presenting for this movie. Anything else? you'd probably have a pretty solid debate on your hands talking with me. So all in all, guys, this is one of my favorites of my childhood and continues to be one of my favorites. It is my favorite film by Peter Jackson. And aside from Back to the Future trilogy, this is my favorite thing that Michael J. Fox has ever done. If you have not seen it, please treat yourself and check this movie out. It's on Blu-ray. It's also on all the VOD services out there. Check it out. Come back. Let me know how you liked it because... It's an absolute classic that deserves more attention. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed that, please click over here for all of my 2023 new release reviews. I'm also gonna put my sex drive review from a couple of days ago for you to check out as well. Please like, share, hit that subscribe button. Check out Dave in the video description if you have not already. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be. <laughs>